Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Lewis. I'm a uh, family medicine specialist. I am here to lecture today on uh, pharmacology, more specifically uh, protein synthesis inhibitors. Uh, bacterial cells uh, have a, a certain type of ribosome called the 70S ribosome, which is different than the human ribosome, uh, which is an 80S ribosome. So that's how uh, these antibiotics that we're going to talk about today will specifically uh, target the bacteria as opposed to human cells. Uh, the bacterial ribosome is composed of two subunits, the 50S and the 30S subunits. Um, and there's a mnemonic that will help us remember which ones bind to the 30S and which ones bind to the 50S subunit. So remember, buy at 30, sell at 50. And the, the mnemonics you need to remember are ATT for the buy at 30 and the CCEL at the sell at 50. And we'll uh, talk about that more uh, later on. There is uh, some possibility for toxicity to host cells because there are some similarities between the bacterial ribosome and uh, mitochondrial uh, ribosomes in humans. And we'll talk about that more uh, later as well. So let's get started. Protein synthesis inhibitors uh, have a wide range of antibiotics. And let me go through them real quick and then we'll talk about them in detail uh, later. Tetracyclines, uh, which include tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, and demeclocycline. The glycocyclines, the one we're going to talk about is tigacycline. Aminoglycosides, which include gentamicin, neomycin, amikacin, tobramycin, and streptomycin. And then the macrolide slash ketolide category includes erythromycin, azithromycin, and clarithromycin. And then there's four other medications that don't fit into other categories, and these are chloramphenicol, clindamycin, uh, quinupristin slash dalfopristin, and linezolid. So let's get started with the tetracyclines. Uh, as we said before, they include tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, and demeclocycline. Mechanism of action, uh, they are bacterial static. Uh, they, are, uh, they have only limited CNS penetration. They bind to the 30S subunit and they prevent amino acyl tRNA attachment. So back to our original mnemonic, buy at 30, sell at 50. So the T in at is the tetracyclines. So they bind to the 30S, remember that part. Another mnemonic that we uh, often use uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the tetracyclines is their antibiotic spectrum. Vacuum the bedroom. So those represent Vibrio cholera, acne, chlamydia, uroplasma, urolyticum, mycoplasma pneumoniae, tularemia, H. pylori, borreliella, burgdorferi, and rickettsia. So let's talk about resistance. Now there's quite a bit of resistance with the tetracyclines and that does limit their use. There is a naturally occurring R factor, and that is an inability of the organism to accumulate the drug. There's actually a magnesium-dependent efflux system that actually kicks the drug out of the, uh, the bacteria. Pharmacokinetics, the absorption is most of the time oral, but you have to remember a very important thing about the tetracyclines is that the absorption can be inhibited by divalent cations, and this is milk, milk products, iron, antacids, all those type of products can inhibit the, uh, the absorption uh, of the tetracyclines. For the distribution, they concentrate in the liver, the kidneys, the spleen, the skin, and very importantly, we'll talk about this uh, later, the teeth and bones. So they bind to tissues undergoing calcification, and tumors also that have a high calcium count will also accumulate this drug as well. So where do these drugs go? What's the fate? So they start off with the liver, they get metabolized there, they go through bile uh, excretion, there's uh, intestinal reabsorption, and then they end up in the, in the kidneys and urine. You must renally dose these uh, medications, um, and you have to be very cautious with people with liver failure. The only exception uh, to that rule is doxycycline because it's a primarily a biliary excretion. It is the drug of choice for uh, any uh, renal compromise. Adverse effects. So, like uh, most antibiotics, its primary um, symptom is gastric discomfort, uh, and this is a primary cause for noncompliance. And this is uh, doubly important because uh, the first time uh, someone has some nausea or some stomach upset, the first thing they might reach for is an antacid. So, uh, unfortunately, with these medications, you take the antacid and the medicine doesn't work anymore, and then uh, you've got yourself a bigger problem. Um, so that's uh, uh, something to really pay attention to and to advise your patients not to take any antacids or, or anything like that while taking these medications. Um, the other big thing that you have to remember, which is often a test question, effects on calcified tissue. So in children specifically, you can get discoloration and uh, hypoplasia of, of their teeth. So you do not want to give this to, to children below a certain age, and we'll tell you uh, about that a little bit more with contraindications. You can get a fatal hepatotoxicity, and this happens most often with pregnant females who have uh, pyelonephritis. 
Phototoxicity is also very common, so uh, people can get severe sunburns, especially when they're taking doxycycline or tetracycline, so they need to be wearing sunscreen and overall just decrease their overall uh, sun exposure. Vestibular problems, you can get dizzy. This happens most often with minocycline. It, it tends to concentrate in the endolymph. Uh, pseudotumor cerebri, which is benign uh, intracranial hypertension, so you can get headache, blurred vision. Uh, this doesn't happen very often. Uh, super infection, so uh, candidal infection, pseudomembranous colitis. Contraindications, uh, what we mentioned before, if anyone has significant renal impairment, you don't want to use it except for doxycycline. And then children under eight, pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, you do not want to use these medications, uh, mainly for the uh, effect on bones and teeth. All right, our next topic is uh, the glycocyclines, and the uh, medication we're going to talk about specifically is tigacycline. Its mechanism of action, it is a bacterial static medication. It binds to the 30S ribosome subunit, and it, it will inhibit protein translation. So going back to our mnemonic by at uh, 30, so this is 30S, and this is another one of the T's that goes with at. Antibacterial uh, spectrum it is an expanded broad spectrum antibiotic, and it, it was primarily developed in order to deal with some of the resistances that we found in the uh, tetracyclines. Um, so uh, it will uh, be used for resistant staph and strep infections, vancomycin resistant enterococci, gram negatives, many anaerobes. But of note, it is not very active with Proteus and Pseudomonas. Its resistance, it was again created specifically to, to fight the resistances that we find in the tetracyclines. Pharmacokinetics, it is an IV drug and then it is uh, eliminated by biliary and uh, fecal elimination. There's no renal dosing that's uh, needed for this. Uh, adverse effects, just like the tetracycline, so that goes uh, with the gastric discomfort, the effects on calcified tissues, and so on. Drug interactions, it is not metabolized by the cytochrome P450, so there are fewer interactions, but it can uh, affect oral contraceptives and warfarin. Next up are the aminoglycosides, and this is a, a big group of, of antibiotics, and it, uh, in years past uh, was a go-to medication for severe gram-negative uh, infections. It was drug of choice for uh, gram-negative bacilli, um, but due to the toxicity and the problems we have with these medications, they've largely been uh, replaced uh, by the third and fourth generation cephalosporins, fluoroquinolones, and the carbapenems. Mechanism of action, it is a bactericidal medication, which is unusual because most of the other protein synthesis inhibitors are bacterial static. Uh, they diffuse into cells, they bind to the 30S, and it interferes with the assembly of the protein. Of special uh, note, it does require oxygen uh, for uptake, so this is not a good medication for any of the uh, anaerobes. And again, going back to our mnemonic, by at 30, the A in at is aminoglycosides. Antibacterial spectrum, this has been used uh, for a long time for empirical treatment of suspected gram-negative bacilli, uh, including Pseudomonas. It, it, it is often used synergistically with beta-lactams, uh, and an example of this it would be in uh, uh, neonatal sepsis. So if you want to treat empirically for um, neonatal sepsis, often we will use something like ampicillin and gentamicin combined. Neomycin, which is in this category of medication, can be used uh, for bowel prep or uh, gastric surgery. Next is uh, resistance. Uh, there can be decreased drug uptake into the, uh, um, into the bacterial cells, and then there can be enzymes that are produced that inactivate the drug. These include acetyl transferase, nucleotile transferase, and phosphotransferases. Pharmacokinetics. Uh, this is, again, bactericidal. It is time and concentration dependent, and there's a post-antibiotic effect. That means uh, after the antibiotic has even left the system, there's still a, a cell death of the bacteria, which is good. Uh, the administration is uh, IV. It is uh, a highly polar category of medications. Neomycin can be used topically, but again, not used very often. Distribution, there is a variable distribution, high concentration in renal cortex and inner ear, and this will go back to our toxicities that we'll talk about later and contraindications. And where do they end up? Well, they end up um, mostly uh, in, the, in the urine. They are, uh, there's a rapid urine excretion, so uh, we'll talk about modification with renal failure as well. Adverse effects. Um, so there's another uh, nice mnemonic that we use with uh, the aminoglycosides, and it goes like this. It goes mean, and the mean means aminoglycosides. NATS, G-N-A-T-S, cannot kill anaerobes. So the G-N-A-T-S are the names of aminoglycosides, and cannot, the N-O-T, is the adverse effects that we'll go over here in a second. And the last part, kill anaerobes, that just reminds you that it needs O2 for uptake, and therefore uh, is a, not a very good medication for anaerobes.
So adverse effects, ototoxicity. So there's an accumulation of endolymph and the paralymph of the inner ear. It will destroy the hair cells and oftentimes this will be irreversible deafness. When we had our, our neonatal sepsis patient, if you were not very careful with the levels in which uh, you were uh, giving that patient uh, gentamicin, you could cause permanent deafness. And that's a real unfortunate problem, but it does happen. Nephrotoxicity, so there's retention in the proximal uh, tubule cells that disrupts the, the calcium transport. Um, again, in the same situation, these happen more often uh, when you're having to use higher dosages or when you're having to uh, dose this more than once a day. There are uh, uh, teratogenic effects, so you probably don't want to give this to pregnant women, and that's part of the, uh, the, the T and the cannot. Infrequently, you'll see neuromuscular paralysis, uh, and this is usually after direct intraperitoneal uh, or intrapleural administration. And then there can be allergic reactions. There's a, a topical contact dermatitis in the neomycin when it's used topically. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. Oh, you look like you've been studying too hard, dear. Well, not to worry, I came up with the cutest little phrase to help you out. What organisms can be treated with tetracyclines? Well, now just think. Vacuum the bedroom. <laughs> Vibrio cholera, acne, chlamydia, urea plasma, urea lyticum, mycoplasma pneumoniae, tularemia, H. pylori, Borrelia burgdorferi, and rickettsia. Don't be so surprised. I watch General Hospital. Okay, now let's review some high yield points covering tetracyclines and aminoglycosides. If you refer to your study guide, there's a section titled Quick Review 1. We're going to start here and go through these questions together. What should you never take with tetracyclines? Um, it was mentioned in the lecture that um, you shouldn't take divalent cations. So you're not supposed to drink milk with tetracyclines, you're not supposed to take antacids, iron containing preparations you're not supposed to ingest with tetracyclines. Another divalent cation is magnesium, so you shouldn't take that either with tetracyclines. All those will interfere with gut absorption of your tetracycline. Number two, which type of antibiotics are amino with which type of antibiotics are aminoglycosides synergistic? These are your beta-lactam antibiotics. And we see this commonly when we treat neonatal infections empirically, like neonatal meningitis, neonatal pneumonia, neonatal sepsis, by giving gentamicin with ampicillin, a cell wall inhibitor, a beta-lactam antibiotic. Number three, what drugs have photosensitivity reactions? There's a mnemonic for this, and it's SAT for a photo, S-A-T, SAT for a photo. The S is for sulfonamides. Um, we'll talk about sulfonamides quite a bit in other lectures. They're particularly dirty drugs that have lots of potential side effects, one of which is photosensitivity reactions. The A in your SAT mnemonic is for amiodarone. And T, we just talked about tetracyclines uh, have photosensitivity reactions. So your, um, your acne patients that are in high school and college that are on tetracy tetracyclines for their acne, you need to tell them to make sure to wear sunscreen. Um, and ideally get covered up and not go into the sun as much because they are more sensitive to getting burned. Number four, why should tetracyclines not be administered in children younger than eight years of age? We never give tetracyclines to kids. We never give fluoroquinolones to kids. So tetracyclines can be deposited in tissues that are undergoing calcification. This can result in stunted growth. and can also result in permanent teeth discoloration kind of an orangey, yellowy, brown discoloration of the teeth that is going to be with you for the rest of your life. It's permanent, so we don't give this to kids. Number five, which aminoglycoside can be given orally? Neomycin is the aminoglycoside that can be given orally. All the other ones are given IV. Why would you give neomycin orally? The reason why you would give it orally is so it can stay in your gut and go through your gut and then wipe out all the gut bacteria. So in instances where you would want to wipe out gut bacteria, you can give oral neomycin such as with bowel surgery. Um, if you're prepping a patient for bowel surgery, you might choose to do this. Number six, why might you see a neomycin given in a patient with hepatic encephalopathy? So patients with severe cirrhosis or liver disease, they have hepatic encephalopathy, they're having altered mental status because their liver is not filtering out toxic metabolites such as ammonia. In these patients, you need to 
um, get rid of either the generation of toxic metabolites such as ammonia or you need to um, excrete toxic metabolites such as ammonia. So uh, lactulose is a syrup that you can drink that goes through your gut and grabs ammonia um, and uh, helps you excrete the ammonia and toxic metabolites. But neomycin is a drug that's going to wipe out your gut bacteria again and in doing so those gut bacteria, guess what they're doing in your gut? They're building up toxic metabolites that you absorb systemically, specifically ammonia. So by giving neomycin, your gut bacteria are no longer making those toxic metabolites. So um, you're not going to be absorbing them. So you're going to have um, less hepatic encephalopathy. So two ways to treat hepatic encephalopathy, lactulose or antibiotics, wiping out the gut bacteria such as neomycin. Number seven, and what over-the-counter topical antibiotic can neomycin be found? Well, it's neosporin. Pretty easy, right? So neosporin is a triple antibiotic. It has neomycin, polymyxin B, and bacitracin in it. Uh, number eight, what medications are known for their potential ototoxic side effects? So this is particularly important if you're studying for USMLA step one, but this is a, a list that's worth knowing. You have aminoglycosides, we just discussed, have to, uh, ototoxic side effects. Vancomycin, cisplatin, and loop diuretics. So four drugs have ototoxic side effects or potentially ototoxic aminoglycosides, vancomycin, cisplatin, and loop diuretics such as furosemide. All these drugs additionally can be nephrotoxic. So ototoxic and nephrotoxic, these four drugs fit into this category. Number nine, what is different about the ototoxicity caused by an aminoglycoside compared to the ototoxicity caused by high dose erythromycin? The erythromycin ototoxicity is reversible, it's transient, and the aminoglycoside ototoxicity can be permanent. Number 10, what organisms most commonly cause urinary tract infections? So when you're deciding what uh, antibiotic to use to treat urinary tract infections, it's important to know which organisms are causing the infection, right? So in general, there's four organisms you should know uh, for community-acquired UTIs or UTIs in the community. E. coli, by and far, number one cause of UTIs. Um, about 80% of UTIs are caused by E. coli. Uh, the three other ones I want you to know are Klebsiella pneumonia, Proteus mirabilis, and Staphylococcus saprophyticus, or Staph saprophyticus. So again, E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Proteus mirabilis, and Staph saprophyticus. So this is a short list. Obviously, there's a lot of organisms that can cause UTIs. These are just tend to be the community ones. And as mentioned earlier, we can treat UTIs with aminoglycosides. Are they your first line treatment for UTIs? No, not really. They can be used, though, to treat UTIs. Your first line are fluoroquinolones, like levofloxacin, um, and then some of your sulfa drugs like TMP-SMX, more commonly known as Bactrim. So fluoroquinolones and TMP-SMX are usually your go-to drugs for UTIs, but you could use an aminoglycoside like gentamicin. Number 11, what organisms are the most common culprits of severe neonatal infections such as meningitis and sepsis? For these neonatal infections, there's three organisms you definitely need to know. There's E. coli, group B strep and listeria. E. coli, group B strep, listeria. Have those ingrained in your brain for neonatal infections. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, ampicillin and gentamicin, that combination together are your go-to drugs for neonatal infections because that combination is going to cover all those organisms. And number 12, when does the dose of aminoglycosides such as gentamicin need to be adjusted to a lower dose? This is particularly important, very clinically useful, because you're going to see this done all the time in renal failure patients. or patients with renal disease, you're going to check gentamicin levels as you're dosing at IV in the hospital. So maybe after every third dose of gentamicin, you check a level to make sure you're, you're in the therapeutic window. Um, um, so gentamicin commonly is given as a second antibiotic in patients with pseudomonas infections. So you're going to see this in the ICU. Um, pseudomonas is a common problem in the ICU. Pseudomonas can cause UTIs resulting in sepsis. Pseudomonas can get into ventilators and cause pneumonia and sepsis that way. And uh, whenever you have a severe life-threatening pseudomonas infection, you need two anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. Commonly one of those is gentamicin. Our next section uh, is dealing with macrolides, and the macrolides include erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, and telethromycin. So the mechanism of action, so this, these are our 50S subunit binders. Again, remember buy at 30, sell at 50, and the erythromycin is, is the E, and the CCEL. So they are uh, bacterial static, 
Um, they may be bactericidal at very high dosages. The binding site is the same or similar to chloramphenicol and clindamycin. So let's talk about the spectrum. These are very uh, commonly used antibiotics. They're used in uh, upper respiratory tract infections, pneumonias, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, especially the gram-positive cocci, um, strep infections and in penicillin allergic patients, mycoplasma, legionella, chlamydia, neisseria. So they have a, a broad spectrum they are used quite often, especially in the outpatient setting. So number one, let's talk about erythromycin. So this was the first macrolide that was produced. And it, originally it was used for penicillin allergic patients. So if you had uh, an infection that generally you would use penicillin for, uh, we were uh, using erythromycin instead. Clarithromycin was used next and it has a, a bit of an expanded coverage. It, it also covered H. influenza, uh, moraxella, and uh, uroplasma. Azithromycin came after that, and it has a slightly less effective against strep and staph infections, but it has better coverage for your H flu, your uh, Moraxella catarralis, and it's, it still covers the chlamydia, uh, urethritis, uh, and AIDS-related uh, MAC-disseminated infections. Of special note, you should probably know, you know, azithromycin is used extensively in the outpatient realm. Um, patients will ask for it uh, specifically. Uh, it is, its name is a Z-Pack, and uh, you should probably be aware that the course that's used is uh, 500 milligrams of azithromycin for the first day, and then 250 milligrams of azithromycin subsequently for four more days for a total of five days. Patients will come to you with any infection at all and expect to get a Z-Pack from you. So, um, just be prepared uh, for that uh, inevitability. Sometimes as, as a physician, it's harder to explain to people why they don't need treatment um, than when they do need treatment. So be aware of that because it's a very uh, good medication, um, though I'm afraid, and I'm sure I've been uh, guilty of this as well, I'm sure I've treated several uh, viral infections uh, with a Z-Pack. So a lot of patient uh, um, education needs to be done when, when using these type of medications because the more we use them, the more likely we are to have resistances. The last one in this group is uh, telethromycin, and it has a similar uh, spectrum as azithromycin, though uh, when it did come out a few years ago, uh, its primary um, benefit was that it had decreased resistances to the uh, strep infections. Subsequently, it's not used as much, and we'll talk about that um, with our adverse effects. Next section is resistance. This, is, again, is a serious problem. Staph infections are, are not very susceptible to uh, these classifications, and there's uh, a couple of reasons for that. One is there's an inability of the organism to take up the drug. Um, so there can be an efflux pump. It's shooting out the, the uh, medication uh, out of the bacteria, and it's not able to accumulate. There's a decreased affinity uh, of the 50S ribosome uh, subunit for the drug, so it's just not attaching right. Um, and then there's uh, erythromycin esterases, which tend to inactivate the drug as well. Pharmacokinetics, administration, most of these have an enteric coating to prevent destruction uh, by gastric acid. Food tends to interfere with erythromycin and azithromycin, but food tends to increase uh, the uptake of clarithromycin. There is an IV of erythromycin, but it, it has a lot of uh, problems with thrombophlebitis. Distribution, it, it distributes very well, but it doesn't make it into the CSF much at all. It is unique because it does uh, distribute into prostatic fluid and it can accumulate in macrophages. Azithromycin has the largest volume of distribution and the longest half-life, and it does accumulate in the liver. Fate, where does this end up? Um, so it does uh, get metabolized by cytochrome P450 uh, for erythromycin and telethromycin. And for excretion, uh, erythromycin and azithro go through a biliary. There's a partial enterohepatic uh, reabsorption. Then it leaves the urine, but it's an inactive metabolite. So there's no renal dosing uh, for renal, uh, renal compromise for erythromycin and azithromycin. Now that's different for clarithromycin because you must renally dose for them if you have a renally uh, compromised patient, uh, you might want to stick more with the azithro as opposed to the clarithromycin. So uh, adverse effects. Number one is a prolonged QT interval, and you have to watch out for that for erythromycin and also for telethromycin. Epigastric distress, uh, over and over again, you'll hear the antibiotics, they upset the stomach. So um, it's the number one cause of noncompliance. Cholestatic jaundice with acute uh, cholestatic hepatitis, you'll see that with erythromycin on occasion, but uh, uncommonly. Ototoxicity, transient deafness, doesn't seem to be permanent. That's with erythromycin as well. 
There are some contraindications. You do not want to give probably any of these medications to anybody with hepatic failure. Sometimes that can be uh, fatal, uh, especially telethromycin. Um, it was commonly uh, touted in the beginning as being sort of the replacement for azithromycin, but then people uh, started dying from uh, hepatic failure, um, and it's been uh, backed off quite a bit in its usage. Interactions, uh, they can increase serum concentration of theophylline and uh, oral uh, anticoagulants. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. So let's go through the answers to quick review two. Number one, what is the most common cause of non-adherence with macrolide use? And this is GI discomfort. When we say GI discomfort, that can mean lots of different things. It can be uh, upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, could be you know, uh, um, gastritis, could be heartburn, could be um, diarrhea even. But in this case, with GI discomfort with macrolides, we're talking about you know, some, some upset stomach, nausea, vomiting. Um, you might see this if for some reason you decide to treat gonorrhea and chlamydia with a very large dose of azithromycin. So sometimes you might see this done clinically. Um, typically, when we are treating gonorrhea and chlamydia, this is something you need to know, the preferred drug regimen is a IM dose of ceftriaxone, usually about 125, 250 milligrams. That in combination with a 10-day dose of doxycycline. So ceftriaxone, one time, doxycycline for 10 days is the go-to drug combination for gonorrhea and chlamydia. I would be very surprised if you didn't have that on some tests throughout your medical career. But, like I was saying, alternatively, you could use a high dose of azithromycin. So normally when we dose azithromycin, we're talking about 250 milligrams, maybe 500 milligrams for a loading dose. But in this case, if you're going to give a one-time high-dose azithromycin to treat gonorrhea and chlamydia, it's 2 grams. It's a lot of azithromycin. So as you can imagine, it may be difficult for a patient to take such a large dose of azithromycin and not throw it up. Um, now, one thing I want to say, there's two bad things about this alternative way of treating gonorrhea and chlamydia with high doses of azithromycin. Number one, you risk the patient vomiting up the drug because of the GI discomfort. And number two, there's an increased resistance of gonorrhea to azithromycin. So this regimen is generally not recommended by the CDC. I'm mentioning it because you might see it done just to be aware of it. But again, what's the go-to drug combination for gonorrhea and chlamydia? Ceftriaxone doxycycline. Number two, of tetracyclines and macrolides, which are safe in pregnancy? So macrolides are safe in pregnancy. They're category B drugs. Tetracyclines are not safe in pregnancy. Never give a tetracycline to a pregnant woman. Number three, what is another non-infectious use for erythromycin? So you might see this used in the ICU for GI motility. So a lot of ICU patients have some ileus in their belly uh, as they're on tube feeds and their body's just not working very well, maybe they're on lots of different medications. So lots of reasons why ICU patients might have ileus. But if you need to feed a patient, sometimes giving erythromycin can help improve the, the gut motility. So you'll see erythromycin used in this instance not as an antibiotic, but simply as a motility agent. Number four. What drug is known for causing acute cholestatic hepatitis? Uh, erythromycin estolate, one drug, one very specific macrolide, erythromycin estolate, is known for causing this acute cholestatic hepatitis, especially if given during pregnancy. So we said that macrolides are category B. This one drug, erythromycin estolate, is the exception. What drugs are known for causing a prolonged QT interval? So we, uh, macrolides can prolong the QT intervals. Uh, obviously, whenever you have um, side effects like this, there's a you know, long list of drugs. If you look in Harrison's or UpToDate or something, you're going to see a long list of these drugs. So let me just give you the short list. Macrolides, antipsychotics, antipsychotic drugs including chlorpromazine, haloperidol, risperidone. The third major category is antiarrhythmic drugs. And within that category, drugs that can prolong the QT interval include amiodarone procainamide, and quinidine. And then one other drug to throw in here is cisapride. Cisapride is another gut motility agent. So macrolides, antipsychotics, antiarrhythmics, and cisapride are the ones to know that can prolong the QT interval. Number six, what is a primary mechanism by which bacteria become resistant to macrolides? Um, this is something worth knowing, definitely testable. Methylation of the 50S 
ribosomal subunit. More specifically, methylation of the 23S ribosomal RNA within the 50S ribosomal subunit. So in your answer choices, you might see that written out either way. So don't let that trip you, out, trip you up. Number seven, what organisms are most commonly responsible for community-acquired pneumonia? So in order to treat pneumonia, you've got to know which, uh, which organisms are causing the pneumonia so you know which drugs to choose from to empirically treat the pneumonia. Now, when we talk about community-acquired pneumonia, there's two main types. There's your typical pneumonia causing your lobar pneumonia, where if you look on an x-ray, an entire lobe of the lung is, is whited out with infection with pneumonia. And then there's atypical pneumonia, or walking pneumonia. And so let's talk about the low bar or typical pneumonias. The organisms that cause that are strep pneumo or strep pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella cataralis. Those are three to know for typical or low bar pneumonias in the community. Atypical pneumonias, walking pneumonias, interstitial pneumonias, this is where the x-ray looks worse in the patient. The patient just might, might have cough and fever as the symptoms, maybe even not even fever, just cough. But these organisms include mycoplasma pneumoniae is the most common cause. There's also Legionella pneumophilia and Chlamydia pneumoniae. So Mycoplasma pneumoniae, Legionella pneumonia, pneumophilia, and Chlamydia pneumoniae are your atypical pneumonias. Now why am I talking about all this? Because it's relevant to the drugs we've just discussed. Azithromycin or your macrolide antibiotics, your macrolide antibiotics can treat all of these organisms. So the drug of choice for community-acquired pneumonia is azithromycin or Clarithromycin. These are your go-to macrolides for, these, uh, for this type of infection in the community. Number eight, what is the half-life of azithromycin? 70, 70 hours. Very long. Almost three days is a half-life, which means when you give a patient a five-day course of azithromycin, that's really going to be in their system for about eight days. All right? Most antibiotics, when we dose them, we dose them for you know, seven to ten days. Right? Azithromycin, you don't have to dose it that long because it sticks around for so long, so you can shorten the course to five days. All right, next section is uh, chloramphenicol. Uh, this is medication is not used as often anymore except for in life-threatening conditions, uh, generally because of its high uh, toxicity. It is a broad-spectrum antibiotic. Mechanism of action, it binds to the 50S uh, ribosomal subunit. Uh, it blocks uh, peptide bond formation and is bacterial static. Antimicrobial uh, spectrum, uh, again, limited use for toxicity, but it works very well for anaerobic infections, uh, Bacteroides fragilis, Clostridium perfringens. It works on meningitis or uh, bacteria like Haemophilus influenza, Neisseria meningitis, and uh, uh, Strep pneumoniae. Resistance, it has this R factor as well. It codes for an uh, uh, acetyl coenzyme A transferase, which inactivates the drug, and then there's also an inability of the drug to penetrate uh, the organism. Pharmacokinetics, uh, it can be an IV or an oral, and it's very uh, lipophilic. It's widely distributed throughout the body. It readily enters the CSF, um, and it is uh, metabolized by the, the liver uh, to a, a glucuronide, and then it is, again, secreted in the, uh, in the kidneys. Adverse effects, and this is probably the most important part of, of this medication, serious anemias, and this seems to be dose-dependent, but it can go all the way to aplastic anemias and can be fatal. Probably uh, for, for testing's sake, one thing you need to know is something called gray baby syndrome. Uh, premature infants, uh, uh, lack liver, uh, UDP, glucuronal transferase, and if the medication builds up, then it can lead to poor feeding, decreased breathing, uh, cardiovascular collapse, cyanosis, which then produces the, the gray color. Interactions, it inhibits uh, some hepatic mixed function oxidases. It can block metabolism of warfarin and phenytoin and tolbutamide and uh, chlorpropramide. Next section, this is uh, clindamycin. The uh, mechanism of action, it blocks peptide bond formation at the 50S ribosomal subunit. It is bacterial static. Uh, it binds similarly, similarly to uh, erythromycin. Therapeutic use, uh, anaerobic infections. Uh, what you'll find on a lot of testing is that uh, they'll uh, ask for what to use for uh, an infection that is a result of a trauma to the abdomen. So you get an abdominal trauma, uh, what type of infection could be going on, and what do you want to treat? And most of the time it's an, an anaerobic infection, you want to use uh, clindamycin. Uh, other uses, you can use this topically for uh, acne. It tends to be bound with benzoyl peroxide uh, and used for that. And occasionally it can be used for skin infections of MRSA. Pharmacokinetics, it is oral, it distributes uh, into all the body fluids except for the CSF. CSF. It can penetrate into bone in absence of inflammation. 
there is an oxidative metabolism, uh, and then it uh, goes to biliary excretion or uh, uh, glomerular uh, filtration. Uh, adverse uh, effects. And this is a big one to remember as well. Pseudomembranous colitis with a Clostridium difficile uh, overgrowth with necrotizing toxins. Most of the time you'll treat this with oral metronidazole or oral vancomycin. Probably the only time you're going to see oral vancomycin used is, is with um, this pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, this is uh, very memorable for me because I had a, a patient uh, back in medical school very early in my third year, so I was you know, very scared. And uh, she ate, unfortunately had uh, an infection and she took uh, clindamycin, which resulted in a severe case of uh, pseudomembranous colitis. She ended up having a, uh, a colon uh, perforation and then subsequently had to have resection of her bowel and then had complications and, and such things. So she was a, a sick lady. Um, and for uh, unknown reasons, every time I'd go into her room, she'd ask to touch my hair. And I'd ask, why would you want to do that? And she said, well, you've got perfect hair. I might as well touch it. Um, so there was some concern that she had some ICU psychosis uh, because she didn't have any uh, psychological uh, disorders that we knew of. Uh, but in fact, she didn't have any ICU psychosis. Um, she just had a really good taste in hair. Moving on, quinupristin slash dalfopristin. It's a combination drug. Mechanism of action, it binds to separate sites on the 50S ribosome. It synergistically interrupts protein synthesis. It is bacterial bactericidal, uh, and it has a long post-antibiotic effect. Resistance. There's an enzymatic process which basically interferes with the drug binding. It involves a, a methylation of bacterial 23S rRNA. Uh, there can also be an inactivation of the drug and there can be an efflux pump that also pumps the drug out of the bacteria as well. Antibiotic spectrum. So um, this is uh, one of the drugs created again to help with the resistances we're seeing in our antibiotics. Uh, it works mainly on gram-positive cocci. Uh, it works on fascium. Uh, including VRE strings or vancomycin resistant enterococci, and it is, uh, has a bacterial static effect um, in those situations. The drug does penetrate macrophages and polymorphonucle poly polymorphonucleosides, and, and it's important because VRE are intracellular, the vancomycin resistant enterococci. It is not effective in uh, E. Uh, uh, faecalis. Pharmacokinetics, it is an IV drug. It penetrates macrophages and um, PMNs, what we uh, mentioned before, and it is, uh, has a biliary excretion. Adverse effects, its primary one is a, is a venous irritation, and central line placement tends to avoid this problem. Uh, you can get arthralgias, myalgias, uh, you can get hyperbilirubinemia. There are some interactions because it is a cytochrome P450 uh, inhibitor. All right, so our last one, uh, linezolid used to combat a resistant gram-positive organisms such as uh, vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. Again, another medication that we've developed to help uh, uh, fight off our, our resistant infections. It binds to the 50S ribosomal uh, subunit, inhibits formation uh, of, the, of the 70S uh, initiation complex, uh, which is specific to the bacteria. Uh, antibacterial spectrum, uh, gram-positive organisms, staph, strep, enterococci, carinobacterium, listeria, uh, mycobacterium, tuberculosis. Uh, these are bacterial static except it is bactericidal against strep and clostridium. Uh, pharmacokinetics, it is oral uh, or IV, and there's a wide distribution. There is no CP450 involvement, and it is renally eliminated. Uh, one of the nice things about this medication is that because it is MRSA uh, effective, a lot of times if you have severe MRSA infections in the hospital, uh, especially things like osteomyelitis, you could have someone stuck in the hospital for weeks. Um, so this is a nice alternative for oral administration uh, of uh, MRSA um, killing uh, uh, antibiotic. So it's still uh, relatively expensive, but it's still a, a lot cheaper than having to spend uh, extra nights in the hospital. Adverse effects, it is overall very well tolerated. Uh, you can get some GI side effects like anything else, headache and rash. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and review the material that was just covered. Before we do that, if you haven't already done so, this might be a good time for you to read your pharmacology text that corresponds to the material that was just discussed. Then together, we're going to go through the quick review in your study guide. Welcome to Stepping Up with me, Richard Sammons. Welcome to Step Up with me, Richard Sammons. Let's get right to it with a test of all that knowledge you've got crammed into your pretty little head. What antibiotic causes gray baby syndrome? I'm feeling a little sweet today, so I'll give you a little hint. 
It's also occasionally used topically to treat eye infections. Ah, right again, smarty pants. Chloramphenicol. Now back to the grind. Drop down and give me 20. Not too hard though. A little help maybe, a little help. Okay, now let's go through the answers to uh, Quick Review 3. If you refer to your study guide, there's a section titled Quick Review 3. We'll be um, talking from this section. So number one, what causes gray baby syndrome? So there's gray baby syndrome, there's gray man syndrome, there's red man syndrome. Gray baby syndrome we talked about can be caused by chloramphenicol. Gray man syndrome can be caused by amiodarone. This is a photosensitivity um, a reaction due to uh, dosing of this antiarrhythmic drug. Amiodarone. Red man syndrome can be caused by vancomycin, and um, vancomycin, uh, one of the ways to treat red man syndrome is by giving an antihistamine and or slowing the infusion of the vancomycin, but we'll talk about that in the vancomycin section. Number two, what is the reason gray baby syndrome may occur in neonates? So neonates, newborns, they, uh, particularly premature infants, neonates, they lack this liver enzyme that conjugates bilirubin. It's called UDP glucuronyl transferase. UDP glucuronyl transferase. Uh, sometimes that, that UDP is dropped off when people are referring to this enzyme and so you just get to glucuronosal transferase. So you'll see this enzyme written out different ways subtly. So this enzyme not only metabolizes bilirubin but it metabolizes other things such as chloramphenicol. So if you have a deficiency um, uh, of this particular enzyme, you're going to have a low capacity to metabolize um, certain drugs such as chloramphenicol, so they're not excreted. And as a result, chloramphenicol is going to accumulate in the, in the system and interfere with the function of the human mitochondrial ribosomes. So too much of this drug, you start to interfere with mito the human mitochondrial ribosomes. Number three. Uh, what organisms are known for causing meningitis? Well, there's strep pneumonia, there's haemophilus influenza, both type B haemophilus influenza and non-typable haemophilus influenza, and there's also Neisseria meningitidis. And so um, these are your three main bugs, strep pneumo, H. flu, and Neisseria meningitidis that cause meningitis, bacterial meningitis that is. Um, now you can use chloramphenicol to treat these, but we said that chloramphenicol is usually not first line for most things. What's first line for treating meningitis empirically is ceftriaxone. So ceftriaxone is usually going to be a go-to, but chloramphenicol can be used. Number four, what is the most serious and potentially fatal adverse effect associated with clindamycin? You can get pseudomembranous colitis caused by clostridium difficile overgrowth. So what happens here is you wipe out your normal gut flora, you allow C. diff to grow in your gut and that really tears up your gut and you get pseudomembranous colitis from that. Is clindamycin the only antibiotic that can do that? No. Any antibiotic that can wipe out your gut bacteria has the potential of, of doing this. All right? it's, just the, it's just that clindamycin tends to be you know, kind of famous for it. Number five, what organisms are obligate anaerobes? So we've talked about some certain drugs that uh, can be used to treat anaerobes. Clindamycin can be used to treat anaerobic infections. Um, what drug cannot be used to treat anaerobic infections? Aminoglycosides, right? But what are your anaerobes? Bacteroides, the genus um, of Bacteroides, like Bacteroides fragilis. These are the most numerous bacteria in your gut, so they're normal flora in your gut. Bacteroides fragilis, if you penetrate your gut in some way, like if you have a perforation during colonoscopy, if you have a gunshot wound or stab wound to the gut, um, then uh, Bacteroides can go in, uh, in places where, where it's not supposed to be and cause bad infections. Other obligate anaerobes include Clostridium. Uh, there's lots of different Clostridium species. There's Clostridium tetany that cause tetanus, Clostridium botulinum that cause botulism, Clostridium perfringens that cause gas gangrene, and then Clostridium difficile, C. diff, that causes C. diff colitis. And again, what drug do we use to treat these obligate anaerobes? Clindamycin and not aminoglycosides. All right. Number six, what drugs are known for causing aplastic anemia? This is a, a list that's worth knowing, um, particularly if you're going to be taking the USMLE Step 1 exam. Um, so on this list, you have chloramphenicol, sulfonamide antibiotics, NSAIDs, such as endomethacin, antithyroid drugs are on this list. These include PTU, also known as propothiouracil, is PTU, 
and then mifimazole is another antithyroid drug. And additionally, we have your anti-epileptic drugs, your anti-convulsants commonly can cause aplastic anemia. And these include carbamazepine, valproic acid, and phenytoin. So again, chloramphenicol, sulfonamide antibiotics, NSAIDs like endomethacin, antithyroid drugs including propothiouracil and mifimazole, and then anti-epileptic drugs including carbamazepine, valproic acid, and phenytoin. And uh, number seven, what uh, treatment for MRSA can cause an increase in blood pressure and thrombocytopenia? This is linazolid can do this. Okay, so now's a good time to pause the video and complete your in-session quiz, then restart the video and we'll go through the quiz together. All right, let's go over the answers to the end of session quiz. The first question, classify the antibiotics into the appropriate drug category. It's important to be able to see a drug name and to recognize what class it falls into. And here's how I would go about this. First of all, the tetracyclines. Well, these are easy. They all end in cycline. So you have tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, and demeclocycline. The next one is the aminoglycosides. I would tackle that next. And you can remember the mnemonic amine NATS cannot kill anaerobes. And that NATS, G-N-A-T-S, stands for gentamicin, neomycin, amicacin, tobramycin, and streptomycin. And then the other category is the macrolides and the ketolides, and that includes everything else on your list. Erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin, and telithromycin, which is a ketolide, not a macrolide. Next question, match the following antibiotics with their common adverse effects. And I find it a little more useful to look at the adverse effects and then try to remember what drug causes that, because that's the way a patient's gonna present. They're gonna show up in your office, and they're having uh, some side effects or some kind of symptom and you're trying to determine what drug they're taking might be causing that side effect. So the first one is gray baby syndrome. This is a classic for chloramphenicol. You just got to remember that chloramphenicol causes gray baby syndrome. Remember neonates lack the enzyme UDP glucuronyl transferase so chloramphenicol builds up and then it begins to act on the host mitochondrial ribosome. The next one, pseudomembranous colitis due to Clostridium difficile overgrowth. Lots of antibiotics can do this, but especially clindamycin. Next one, gastric distress. All right, I'm looking at this list. That's pretty vague. I'm going to skip it for now and come back to it and see what's left over at the end. Uh, the next one is discoloration of kids' teeth. Well, this is classic for tetracycline. Remember, tetracyclines affect calcified tissues such as teeth. Uh, and also photosensitivity. Remember the, the mnemonic SAT for a photo, which stands for sulfa drugs, amiodarone, and tetracycline. So discoloration of kids' teeth and photosensitivity is the tetracyclines. The next one, ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Remember we had the mnemonic amine NATs cannot kill anaerobes, and the NOT, N-O-T, stands for the adverse effects of the aminoglycosides. So uh, N for nephro, uh, nephrotoxicity, O for oto, ototoxicity, and amine reminds you that it's aminoglycosides. And the T in uh, the not is for teratogenic. So nephrotoxicity, ototoxicity, teratogenic should make you think of aminoglycosides. And that brings us back to gastric distress. Well, the only one left is the macrolides. And the gastric distress with macrolides typically includes nausea, vomiting, and some dyspepsia. All right, the next question, what is the mechanism of action of linazolid? Linazolid binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit, so it interferes with the formation of the 70S bacterial ribosome initiation complex. Next question, what is the primary mechanism by which bacteria become resistant to macrolides? Bacterial resistance is a big problem, and you kind of need to know how bacteria become resistant to different classes of antibiotics. So for macrolides, you get methylation of the 50S ribosomal subunit, or more specifically, methylation of the 23S ribosomal RNA within the 50S subunit of the ribosome. So you can see that written either way, and it should make you remember that's the mechanism of bacterial resistance to macrolides. Next question, match the following bugs with the most ideal drug or the alternative drug. So the first one is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Lots of drugs simply don't work against Pseudomonas, but the aminoglycosides do. Also, you could use fluoroquinolone, carbapenem, uh, some cephalosporins, and anti-pseudomonal penicillins. So aminoglycosides do treat pseudomonas, and the aminoglycoside listed is gentamicin. The next infection is syphilis. 
Uh, syphilis or treponema pallidum is one of those rare infections that are still susceptible to plain old penicillin G. So you can use penicillin G for syphilis, but if the patient is allergic to penicillin, uh, erythromycin would be a good alternate. The next infection is MRSA or methicillin resistant staph aureus. MRSA infections can be very hard to treat, but remember we said linazolid is an oral drug that can be used to, to treat MRSA, even deep tissue MRSA infections like osteomyelitis. Other oral drugs used to treat MRSA might include clindamycin, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and rifampin. The next one is chlamydia pneumoniae. Dr. Jenkins talked about how you can treat chlamydia with a large single dose of azithromycin. But remember, the go-to regimen is ceftriaxone plus doxycycline. But that wasn't an option, so we have to pick azithromycin. Next question, what organisms can be treated with tetracyclines? Now, I always think of tetracyclines as the, the antibiotic to use for these strange, unusual infections. Basically, if I'm taking a test and I see some oddball, rare infection, I don't know what the treatment is, if tetracycline is, is one of the choices, that's what I'm going to pick. So the mnemonic you can use to remember the bugs is vacuum the bedroom. This stands for Vibrio cholera, acne, chlamydia, urea plasma urea lyticum, mycoplasma pneumoniae, tularemia, Helicobacter pylori, but remember you don't treat Helicobacter pylori with tetracycline alone. You use it as part of a multi-drug regimen. Borrelia, which is a bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And rickettsia, which is the bacteria that causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Next question. If a patient suffers a traumatic wound to the abdomen, you would expect anaerobic contamination predominantly with which organism? Remember we said the most common anaer anaerobic bacteria in the gut is Bacteroides fragilis. And which antibiotic would best target this infection? Clindamycin. Remember Dr. Lewis mentioned that chloramphenicol also works for Bacteroides, but it's way too toxic for common use. So clindamycin is the, the best drug for a penetrating abdominal wound with a Bacteroides or anaerobe infection. Next question, what is the mechanism of action of each of the following antibiotics? So remember the mnemonic, buy at 30, sell at 50. Uh, for the tetracyclines, it's a 30S inhibitor. It blocks tRNA acceptor sites at the 30S subunit. You can remember tetracycline starts with a T, just like tRNA. Aminoglycosides, these are 30S inhibitors that interfere with the ribosome assembly and or a ribosome's ability to read accurately. So the hint is that aminoglycosides starts with A, just like assembly. Macrolides, these are 50S inhibitors, specifically at the 23S ribosomal RNA, as we said. These bind ribosomes and inhibit translocation steps in protein synthesis. The next one, chloramphenicol, another 50S inhibitor that binds ribosomes and inhibits peptidyl transferase activity. Clindamycin is the same as the macrolides. It's a 50S inhibitor uh, that binds ribosomes and inhibits translocation steps in protein synthesis. And linazolid binds to the 50S ribosomal subunit and inhibits formation of the 70S ribosome initiation complex. Remember, all the 50S inhibitors, including macrolides, chloramphenicol, clindamycin, and linazolid bind to sites on the 50S subunit that are nearly identical. Next question, which class of antibiotic should never be ingested with milk or iron? The answer is tetracyclines. Remember, divalent and trivalent cations will chelate tetracyclines and impair absorption. So these include calcium, either in milk or, or calcium supplements, iron supplements, magnesium, aluminum. These are often found in antacids like Tums. So there are a lot of things that will impair tetracycline absorption. Next question, which drugs have ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity as side effects? Well, we already mentioned the aminoglycosides, but also vancomycin, loop diuretics such as furosemide, and cisplatin. So that's the end of your end of session quiz.